From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hello, everyone. It's a special Cube Conversation. I'm John Furrier here in the Cube. I'm not in the studio. I'm at home. We're sheltering in place. Uh, the studio quarantine crew is there. We've got a great guest here to break down the analysis in the tech industry, Zee Carvala, who's the uh, principal of ZK Research. Uh, Zee, it's great to check in with you for our check-in. Last time we chatted, you broke down the entire industry. A lot to talk about now. We had the Cisco earnings just came out and a lot of other great things are happening. Thanks for joining me. Well, what's your take on what's going on? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, John. It's uh, It's been sort of a tumultuous last few months. Uh, I think one of the takeaways I had from Cisco's earnings actually was that it's not as bad as people think. I, I know if you read a lot of what's going on in the media, we get everything from doomsday and the world's ending or whatever, but I, I think what Cisco's earnings showed, and, and Cisco, I know they have a lot of enemies and a lot of competitors out there, but they're really still a bellwether for the industry. And so everyone should rejoice in the fact that they actually had a pretty good quarter. Um, I think what was, uh, was telling about that was uh, security was up, the services business was up, uh, the margins were good. And what that shows me is that there's still room for innovation. Customers will actually are still buying things and they're willing to pay for things that actually help drive their business forward. And so Cisco's put a lot of energy into their services group to make sure that customers were able to adapt their technology and change their business, right? And so from an overall market perspective, Cisco is, you know, their, their quarters are a quarter shifted from almost everybody else's. And so they're generally a leading indicator of where things are going. So I think the fact that they showed some strength, they guided up from where the street thought, I think that's a good thing for the entire industry. And I think, um, uh, I'm not saying we're out of this yet, but I, I think businesses are starting to spend money where they need to in order to put themselves in a position to come up strong after, well, once we start going back to work, uh, whoever knows what that'll be. I think the other sort of interesting pivot here is that uh, I think the overall role the network has changed within companies, right? We've covered networking technologies a long time. It, it gets a little bit of interest sometimes from C-level, uh, certainly not as much as it should from CEOs and, and, and CIOs. Uh, a lot of people think of it as the plumbing in the pipes. It's hard to understand. It's a very complicated technology sometimes. But when you look at what's happened um, with digital transformation initiatives and now with COVID, we've got more people working from home, we're adopting cloud services, we're using video, we're connecting more things with IoT initiatives. So the overall value of the network has increased. And I think that was also reflected in Cisco's numbers. Uh, I think this transition had started when you look at a lot of the building blocks of digital transformation, IoT, cloud mobility, things like that. They're all network centric in nature. And so for the first time in history, I think business leaders actually need to look at their network strategies because if that's with, without a sound network strategy, uh, as we sort of come out of this and the companies that have a good one will be able to really step on the gas and do what they want with their business. The ones that don't, I think, are going to really struggle to survive because they're not going to be able to do a lot of these advanced things. Yeah, great point. One of the things, first of all, the new Cisco has a new leadership, new CEO has been in place for a while. Yeah. Uh, cloud it's native exactly. is a positioning they're going after. And, you know, with the COVID crisis, it really puts more pressure not to move with the network because it's a core staple of an organization yet the transformation journey is going to be accelerated. This gives Cisco, a, this is a lucky strike for Cisco because you got to move packets around and the multi-cloud conversation comes in and the enablement of application development, all being tied to the network is what Cisco has been preparing on. And this has kind of been a nuanced point that not everyone understands, but coming out of COVID to have a growth strategy, if you're not programming up and down the stack with DevOps and NetSecOps or whatever you want to call it, people working at home, a new perimeter has now emerged. That's everything. Yeah, everything is a perimeter. This is, isn't it, this is a tailwind for Cisco. Your thoughts on that, your opinion. Oh yeah, it's a big time tailwind for Cisco. I think what, what's happened, John, when you look at network evolution over the last five years, uh, we can do much more with our network. That's coming to cost and that cost is complexity. So trying to tie all these things together, SD-WAN, SASE, data center SDN, right? Um, uh, we've got Wi-Fi 6 coming, we've got 5G coming. So we've got all these great things that are going to let our networks be faster than before and run applications we could never run before, right? You look at some of the demos on 5G, we're able to wear uh, untethered Wi-Fi or um, um, virtual reality headsets, complete, creating completely new shopping experiences, educational experiences, but you need a lot of bandwidth for that. But not only do you need bandwidth, I think the one thing that COVID has taught us is 
if you have any weakness in the network anywhere, right, from the user's hand all the way to the cloud, that weak point gets big time. And so now you have to start thinking of your network not in pieces of having a campus network, Wi-Fi network, data center network, um, and have a single network, right? And so Cisco is really one of the few companies, maybe the only company, that can actually deliver that end-to-end -end network that starts in the company, extends to people's homes, goes out to the cloud. And with what they've done masterfully under Chuck Robbins is they've been able to pile those things together to create a much simpler way of operating this complicated network. So you look at what they're doing uh, you know, with ACI and intent-based networking. What that is is you can think of it almost as a software overlay that masks the complexity of the network that's underneath it. Yeah, I've always been talking about Cisco over the past decade and a half. Got to move up the stack, guys. You got to move up the stack. Yeah. This has been, and this is now their opportunity. And with multi-cloud on the horizon or here, this is going to give Cisco a path. But I got to ask you, what is your take and advice to Cisco when you're out there talking to them? You're talking to the um, customers all the time and practitioners. You're the analyst. Um, what do they need to do better? Because you can't just wish multi-cloud upon the, the marketplace. It's coming, but it's yeah. clearly not the use case yet. So mm. there's a time lag between ACI and tent based networking to true multi-cloud. What does Cisco do in the meantime? Yeah, well, I think what Cisco has to do is, is think about what they're doing with, with ACI um, and multi-cloud and actually help their customers implement it in uh, in pieces. And uh, what the, the, the description I've used is, is the path Cisco's on and the path customers are on actually in this world of, you think if the end state is true hybrid multi-cloud, right? Um, we have to get there in chip shots and not moon shots. And what I mean by that is if you were to say to a customer, this is your end state, right? The path to get there is so daunting. It's like a moon shot that it paralyzes the customer. If you break this down into a set of chip shots, right? That gets much easier. So, so put the infrastructure in place to be able to just have the visibility across your cloud then maybe automate movement from high, private to public cloud, right? Then automate some of the processes that give you the most headaches, then move to a bigger autom autom automation framework, right? So areas like security, um, uh, network configuration, right? Things like that, those are, th those are very difficult for customers to do manually. Those are the things they should be automating today. So what they want to do is almost take, take their, their uh, intent-based network almost as a lighthouse to road to, a visionary state, and then help customers get there in pieces because if they try and rush them along too fast, uh, I think they'll lose the customer because the complexity is too high. Uh, the other area they should really be focused on is continuing to mature the services business. I think that's something under Chuck Robbins that's a night and day different than what it was. The services business to Cisco prior to Chuck was a lot of break fix. You know, their, their TAC is well renowned as being a great TAC, but now they've gotten more into pro services, they've gotten more into adoption services. And I think the more subscription they sell, what Cisco needs to really understand is that customers tend not to renew things they don't use, right? So making sure that the services group helps customers and uh, use the things that they're paying for, and that'll pay dividends for them, uh, mul multiple dividends for them down the road. I want to get the Silicon One and that opportunity to upsell and do a refresh because hardware refreshes are not going to be on the docket early on unless it's got business value. So let's hold that for a second. Um, John Chambers has been on theCUBE recently in his new role as a coach and investor. Um, and he, he said to us on theCUBE, you know, transitions versus transformations. Cisco and the big companies are expected to win the transitions. But now with COVID coming out of this, there's real transformation. So you got to look at things like collaboration. Hey guys, get it better. This is not just win the enterprise with a better WebEx. Zoom is kicking ass. Yeah. Um, Teams is out there. So, you know, Cisco is, has a huge collaboration piece and a bunch of other business. So where's their transition wins and where's their transformational opportunity in your opinion? Well, I think the entire company is kind of going through transformations, right? Even on the network side. Um, so it's my, it's my, you know, the, the industry has been calling for Cisco to get commoditized for years, right? And if you look, their product gross margins are actually the strongest they've been in a decade, right? So. I remember when it fell below 60%, everybody thought the world was falling. This, this quarter, I think it was a little over 65 on the product side. And so my belief is nothing's really a commodity if you can drive innovation. And that's what Cisco has been doing. So from a transition standpoint, I, I, I think they've done a lot of that. They've transitioned the company to software and services. They've transitioned the company more to a recurring model. They've actually 
decouple the software from the hardware so customers can buy differently. And you brought up the fact that we may not have a hardware refresh, but that's okay as long as they keep the software renewal cycles going. Where the transformations has to come is completely change the dynamics of how something works. And so with intent-based networking, you, you think of the old way that a network engineer used to work, like the way I used to work when I was an engineer, a lot of hunting and pecking and, uh, at a CLI, doing a lot of cutting and pasting and using homegrown tools. That doesn't scale anymore. So my research shows that on average, it takes companies about four months uh, to implement a change network-wide, far too slow for digital company, right? So what Cisco's done is they've accelerated that by letting customers automate more things. And so for Cisco, the transformation comes in allowing customers to do new things. I think you're right on the collaboration side, there's more work to do. Nobody's got a bigger collaboration portfolio than Cisco. They got endpoints, they got room systems, right? They've got software, they've got cloud on-prem, but they got to take that and, and tie it together. And I think the other area that Cisco needs to improve in is on, they've, they've got a lot of uh, uh, management tools um, that, that look at different things they have AppD, ACI Manager, uh, and, and a whole bunch of different security consoles. Uh, in fact, I've, I've poked fun at them sometimes and said that the market leader in single panes of glass because they have more than anybody, right? I, I think eventually they got to be able to tie that information together and help customers understand what it means from a cross-domain perspective because they still build their products, wireless campus data center. But as I mentioned before, we just have one network. And so if Cisco can aggregate this data up apply machine learning to it and help customers what that means to, to see insight across the entire network. That would really be powerful because they, they've got the footprint. Now they just have to be able to deliver the machine learning based insights to help customers understand what that data means. And they have a unique opportunity in the short term. No one's going to be kicking Cisco out anytime soon. With no, I, I think during the COVID, you're right. There, there is safety, right, in, in using the big companies. Um, uh, I, I think what, what, what Cisco is able to bring is a is a level of, of uh, financial stability that other companies may not have. And so they can weather the storm for a long time. So, you know, I, I, it, it's easy to say going to Cisco is the safe bet. It has been for a long time, but, but, I, but I think it's also the smart bet. I, I think they're, they're able to continue to invest in things where maybe smaller companies won't be able to. Yeah, my question on Cisco, big fan of their strategy, have been vocal about that for a while. My question on Cisco, if I'm going to be critical, is to say, how fast can you get that development going show the software value in market, show customers a growth trajectory that they can execute on, they can advantage the network policy intelligence. If they could do that, they're going to be in good shape. You agree? Yeah, I, I think one of their challenges though is the transformation of their customer base too. And that's where the work Susie Wee's been doing on the DevNet team is so important. Like if, if they were to shift their whole strategy over to developer focused software today, uh, I think that would largely Put them in a position of trouble because the engineers that work with the stuff and the resellers that work with the stuff aren't they don't really have the skill sets to take advantage of that right so last year susie we um you know she really talked a lot about the growth of devnet this year they came out with in barcelona this year they they came out with a bunch of certifications uh for devnet now um they're they're actually coming out with a number of uh, partner certifications as well so the resellers can get certified but i think it's important that they continue to push their engineer base into get, gaining these new skills. So I'll give you an interesting data point from my research, and that's, did you know that only about a quarter of network engineers has ever made an API call, right? And so you look at all Cisco's new gear, it's all API driven. And so if you want to do something as simple as say, get all the IP addresses in your network, you can just use an API call for that, right? The other way to do it is you do a show command and a CLI and you screen scrape and you take a visual basic script that you parse it, you know, and, and, and you get it that way, right? So the API methods, uh, using those is a lot easier. And so I think Cisco's got a good strategy with DevNet. They've grown that base a lot. It's still relatively small, you know, it's under a million people. When you think of the overall size, of the Cisco customer user base, okay. that's, where, that's where they got to put some effort, right? More and more effort into driving adoption of DevNet. Well, I think you're smart on that. I think your research, and they, they must be listening to you because they haven't really tried to jam that down their throats. They've been very humble about it. And I think a million is a pretty damn good number, I think, um, in Cisco. Again, to your point, they're bringing people into the water, <laughs> yeah. the low end first before you yeah, you go to the deep end. So play, swim with the bubble, if you will. Um, well, I think what was smart with DevNet, what they did was they assumed the engineer had no knowledge of software. Because I, I think at, at first when they put the, a lot of the programs in place, they assumed people would have some knowledge of how to code. 
right? And and I, I also think the industry did them a, a bit of a disservice. We used to, there was a lot of stuff written in the media how every network engineer needs to become a software developer. Well, they don't have to. Some are going to become software developers, but they at least have to become software power users, right? So do your job through software, but you don't have to be a developer. And that's where DevNet really, when it really matured, is it diverged down two paths, developer, engineer, here's your common software skills, and then you break down into specialists after that. And so they've They've actually uh, helped with the maturity of that. They've, they've changed their certification programs to reflect that. And I think DevNet really is a big key. And if they can transition that engineer base, then it helps the adoption of the new technology. Aziz, I want to get your final thoughts on this uh, segment on multi-cloud. Obviously, it would be a really great win for, it creates some interoperability, especially with the network intelligence Cisco could bring to the table and others. You got some startups out there like Aviatrix and others and VMware with NSX trying to get the, where the security fabric, a lot of action going on with multi-cloud and networking. Your thoughts, what does your research tell you? What's going to transpire? How do you see that market playing out? Yeah, my research shows that a uh, little over 80% of companies prior to COVID had multi-cloud on the roadmap. And I'm assuming that's that's gone up. I haven't actually done a survey since then. Um, one of the, I, th I think um, it's funny, COVID exposed a lot of things from a lot of vendors, right? And I, I think one of the things it did is it showed cracks in the cloud. Yeah, you, you look at some of the, the data and how many outages Microsoft had, Google had some strains. AWS has held up pretty well under the strain of, um, uh, of a lot of the, the, the higher utilization from COVID, but uh, they've been building a lot of capacity into theirs as well. So I think from a, a customer perspective, it makes sense. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Some cloud providers are stronger in some regions. They, they each have different their own uh, different cloud platforms and other the, the private cloud platforms. And the problem is, is if you decide if you decide to go multi-cloud, you can't use the cloud provider's tools, right? So if I use an AWS load balancer, that works great in AWS, but it's not going to help me with Azure or GCP. Similarly, if I use GCP tools, I can't extend that out to Azure. So something needs to connect those and be able to tie security and policy. And that's where multi-cloud comes from. And you're right, there's some good startups there. I, I think um, the difference with Cisco this time versus the SDN world was when SDNs came about, I think Cisco um, didn't want that to happen. And I think they actually actively worked against SDN. And I've talked to Chuck Robbins about that. And he said, you'll never ever see Cisco do that again. If something's good for the customers, they want to lead that transition. And so Cisco has been very active in multi-cloud. Okay. And given they've got the install base already, I do think they will help bring this along, but there are some good startups in it. Uh, um, yeah, it's interesting. SDN really wasn't ready for prime time, even when VMware bought Nisera. I mean, it was still there. It didn't have a lot of revenue. It had yeah, future, I think but it I mean, you know, like, <laughs> 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 they made a good deal. Yeah. Um, yeah, VMware claims that's the uh, saves, and NSX was saved by SDN. Some people say it was completely rewritten. Final thoughts on Outlook that you see coming out of COVID. Obviously, um, it's been well reported. We've been reporting. The VPNs have been under provision. That was a blind spot. Yeah. A lot of blind spots and disruption that wasn't forecasted in the classic sense. There was no, um, there was no, um, you know, hurricane. There was no flood. It was a COVID invisible disruption. Yeah, and there's no end cast either, right? Like even with when you think of uh, what happened with the the floods in New York and 9/11 people knew that they'd eventually go back. And so business continuity and disaster recovery was a temporary thing. Can I, can I set up a data center to work for a couple of months so I can go back to New York? That's not the case with COVID. We're, we're, we're trying to manage for an, an undefined endpoint, which is extremely difficult from an IT perspective. I, I do think that COVID, again, has highlighted the value of the network. I think we'll see a lot of transition from VPN to SD-WAN. I think that's, that, that's certainly good. I think the rise in video will also cause a Wi-Fi upgrade cycle where people get back to the office. And I think you'll see a lot of focus on programmability and agility, because I don't believe we're going to see everybody return to the office with one big bang, John. I, I think what we're more likely to see is the future of work be almost like when you and I were in college. We do a bunch of stuff at home. We go to the campus when we have classes and when we want to meet people. Similarly, we'll go to work when we have meetings. And then in between meetings, we'll go find an open place to work. But in general, we'll do a lot of work, a lot more work from home. In fact, my research shows 93% of the business leaders I interviewed said they expect to see at least a 30% increase in work from home post-COVID, right? So we're going to have a lot more people doing that. But 
it's not going to be everyone working from home and everybody working in the office. It's going to be a hybrid of the two. People are going to come and go, and that drives the need for agility. And today's networks really aren't that agile. And so I do hey, think back that's to school. Cool. I want to go back to college. We do Thursday happy hours too. I mean, have the whole week. I'll meet you there. I'll meet you the student. Great stuff. Great stuff. Final point. Um, you have mentioned SD WAN. Um, I was talking with Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman just last week, and I said, you know, this SD WAN today is not your grandfather's SDN, meaning SD WAN has changed a lot. It's basically the internet now. So, what what's the modern update definition of SD WAN? I mean, it used to be you connect a wide area network, you connect from campus, you do some networking. What is it now? What's well, the same name, but it's you know. What is it? What well, I mean, it, it has the changed, and right part of that is the maturity of the technology. If you look at the adoption of anything, right, the first wave of stuff is to make the new stuff look like the old stuff. So when we put VoIP in, we made it look a lot like TDM. When we had cloud, we lifted and shifted and had we didn't really change our apps. And then we eventually get smart and think, what can I do with the new thing that I can't do with the old thing? And so a lot of early SD WAN deployments were simply just replacements for MPLS and they were put in to save a bit of money. But now companies are getting smarter and they're thinking about what can I do with my SD-WAN that I couldn't do before? So there's a lot more tighter integration with security, I think, as companies put SD-WAN in. And, and think about what the WAN is today, John. It used to be corporate offices and data centers. Today it's everybody's house, right? And so being able to extend your WAN out to single people, out to um, uh, planes, trains, and automobiles, if you remember that movie, but those are all getting connected as well. Uh, people's backpacks, fan kiosks, those are all becoming WAN endpoints, right? So that's where you need to embed more security in the network. And so I think that's a transition we're seeing in the SD WAN. And I think the, the technology has matured to the point where it's getting easier to deploy, faster to deploy. And you're right, we can use the internet for transport in some cases. Some will still keep, there'll still be a lot of MPLS out there. Um, but I, I do think we wind up in this hybrid world, but clearly the, the time has never been better for for SD-WAN, and I think we'll see a I huge agree. growth curve for that because it's the only way to extend the WAN to, to people's homes, to things, to cars, and really anything that's connected. You know, that's such a great point, and I think this is a real nuance in the industry. It's a whole nother rebirth of the category because the aperture is wider, you got policy, you got reliability, you got security um, built in. This is key, key to the edge, it's all key. So the whole automation, concept. yeah. Yeah, whole, the whole concept of AI ops becomes real because we're collecting data and we're able to use AI to automate operations. So Aziz, we call it SD-WAN 2.0. That's what we got to do. We got to make a, an acronym out of this. Come on, we can't just call it SD-WAN. It is SD-WAN 2.0 because it's the next, it's the it's it's the second wave of it where we're actually thinking about how to transform our company. So the the John Chambers quote of transition for trans versus transformation is, is apropos because the, like I said, a lot of the waves that, that Cisco went through early on was we transitioned the market and then we transformed, right? And so SD-WAN so far has been transitional, moving away from the old thing, but now it's tra time to transform the way our, our entire network operates. This great insight. Always a pleasure to talk to you. You've got the straight scoop and signal right there from all the noise in the industry now more than ever. People are going to be focused on critical projects. So thanks for your insight, uh, ZK. Uh, can research, great stuff, and we'll keep Keep calling you in. Great guest. Thank you for coming on. Thanks, John. Always a pleasure. Okay, keep conversation here remote. We're doing our part either at home in the studio, quarantine in. This is the Cube virtual. Virtualization has come to the Cube. We'll do we'll do whatever it takes to get the content out there. Zeese, thanks so much for coming coming on. Great. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching. I'm John Furrier.